Take your Bibles and turn with me, if you would, to Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter. Ecclesiastes, chapter 12. And I want to read those first seven verses tonight. Ecclesiastes 12, 1 through 7. All right? Wednesday night is a good time to get her tank filled up. Okay, we're about halfway through the week, and so it's a good time just to uh, kind of get refreshed in the Lord. I hope you've had a good week, and hope you're going to have even a better week ahead. So we'll just worship the Lord tonight. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun or the light or the moon or the stars be not darkened, nor the clouds return after the rain. In the day when the keepers of the house shall tremble, and the strong men shall bow themselves, and the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look out of the windows be darkened. And the doors shall be shut in the streets. When the sound of the grinding is low, and he shall rise up at the voice of the bird, and all the daughters of music shall be brought low. Also, when they shall be afraid of that which is not high, and, fe and fears shall be in the way, and the almond tree shall flourish, and the grasshopper shall be a burden, and desire shall fail, because man goeth to his long home, and the mourners go about the streets." Or even the silver cord be loosed, or the golden bowl be broken, or the pitcher be broken at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the cistern. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. And I would call your attention to verse 12, or to chapter 12 again, verse 1. Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. Let's pray. Almighty God, our Father, we pause in this service tonight to give you thanks and to give you praise for, for thy great blessings. And Lord, we just uh, ask that you'll be with us every day. Strengthen us in the Lord. Help us to put on the whole armor of God every day. And Lord, help us to fight the spiritual battles that we need to fight. Give us victory in the Lord. Now we pray you'll encourage us and strengthen us every day and draw us close to thee. Bless this service tonight that it'll be what, what you want it to be. In Jesus' name. And we continue to pray for lost people everywhere. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to preach tonight on the subject, getting to know God as creator. How much do you know about the Lord? If someone asked you, who is God? What's he like? Could you tell them? Would you have a ready answer for those questions? It's important that we know God as our creator and that we know him personally. Today probably is no other time in human history People's faith is being challenged about the origin of life. The Christian's faith that the God of the Bible is the creator is challenged. It's challenged in four major ways. First of all, it's the young earth versus the old earth. Because traditionally Christians have believed that the world has been here for about 5,000 years or 6,000 years. Uh, scientists have carbon-14 testing and other things today, and that's being attacked today because it's being stated that the earth is about four billion or five billion years old. Uh, carbon-14 has its problems. Christians, Christian scientists are quick to point that out. But Christians are told that to believe the Bible and what it teaches, and I don't think you can really set the age of the earth by the scripture, but Christians are told to believe the Bible is old fashioned. Secondly, it's the interpretation, interpretation of the evidence of fossils. Creation scientists interpret the fossil evidence one way. The evolutionists interpret the fossils another way. Third, it's the claim that evolution is a fact. You see, the world claims that science has proven evolution to be a fact. Christians point out that there's some evidence, but it's not proven. That there's evidence also for creation that... Uh, 
the world refuses to look at. And the fourth thing is it's a random evolution versus intelligent design. The world starts out with the idea that everything happened by chance. Christian scientists start out with the idea that God created everything and they're just trying to discover how. But Christians are told to believe that God created everything, and especially if you believe that God created everything in six days, is old-fashioned and out of date and is impossible. Faith in God and the Bible is the Word of God is being challenged today. And it's important that we get to know God, the Creator, and understand our faith in the Lord as our Creator. And as I said a moment ago, it's important that we know Him personally. Let me ask you tonight. Do you know God, your Creator? Do you believe in Him? And do you know Him personally? Do you have a personal relationship with the God of the Bible? First of all, God reveals Himself as man's Creator. In Genesis 1.1 it says, In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The first thing that a person reads when they open the Scripture is that God, the God of the Bible, made everything. The word that, for God that is used there in Genesis 1.1 is, is used in different ways. Uh, as we study, we find out that it's, it's a word that has a plural meaning. It's a word that uh, means the all-powerful God. When it's applied to the God of the Bible, especially, it means, well, when it's applied to the God of the Bible, it means the all-powerful God. But it's also applied, in, even in the scripture, to false gods. It's applied to angels. It's applied to men. But when it's referring to the God of the Bible, it's referring to the all-powerful God. It means the strong one, the mighty leader, the supreme deity. Now, if you go on down in Genesis 1 and verses 21 and verse 27, a different name for God is used that implies, or, or doesn't imply, it says he's the creator. In Genesis 1, it says, so God created man. There's that word created. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created him. Male and female created he them. So that first word that we find there in Genesis 1, 1 is talking about God the creator, the all-powerful God, and it opens up the idea of the Trinity that we read through the Scripture, all through the Scripture, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. So you see, God introduces Himself in the Bible. When you first open the Bible, God introduces Himself as the Creator. And He wants us to know He didn't just create this world that we live in. He created everything that is. Without him there was nothing made that is made. God is not only the creator of this universe, he is the creator of all universes and everything that is. In Colossians, the first chapter, verse 16, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. It's necessary to know him as the creator. It's necessary to know who he is. In fact, the liberal view of scripture today says that you can know the God of the Bible and you can doubt the scriptures and you can say the scriptures are not true and still know the God of the Bible. I don't believe, as you read through the scripture, this word that is used for God as the creator, the all-powerful one, is used uh, over 40 times in the Bible to refer to the God of creation. And well, think about that. In Isaiah, and in Jeremiah, and in, in other places in the scripture, God is referred to as the creator. How can you say I believe in the God of the Bible and doubt the, 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 the evidence that we have in scripture that he is the creator? Because the Bible says, and he says, I, I created everything. So you see, to believe in God, we must know him. And that means accepting his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
That means knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and believing in Christ. You cannot separate God from His Word. You cannot separate the Lord Jesus Christ from His Word. I'm not anybody's judge. I just don't understand how someone can say, I believe, I believe in God. I have a personal relationship with God, but I don't believe His Word. I believe you have to believe the Word of God. You see, if He is not the Creator, He is not the only one. Did you ever think about that? If he is not the creator, he's not the only one. If he's not the only one, he's not the owner. And if he's not the owner, he's not, if he's not the owner, he has no right to judge. You see, everything fits together, doesn't it? He's either creator or he's not creator. He's either judge or he's not the judge. Unless you believe like the one group does, that God was once a man. And somehow he became a God. I've never figured that out. I've never figured out how they get people to believe that kind of thing. I guess somehow he went to a humanistic university and he, and he went through the university and he got his diploma and they told him he's a god. They believe that God was once a man. My friend, the Bible says that God is not a man. He is the creator. How can you get people to believe that the God who created everything that is was once a man? If I didn't even have a Bible, I couldn't believe that. But the Bible says that's not true. You see, do you see why the humanist, the atheist, and others try to prove that there is no God? Because you see, if there is no God, there is no Bible. If there is no Bible, there is no church. If there is no church, there is no right and wrong, and you can do whatever you want to do. You don't, you're not responsible for anything. There is no right and wrong. And that's the way society is going today. That's what people want to believe. You know, we're responsible as human beings to use the brain that God has given to us. We are created as moral beings, and God gave us a mind to use. Listen, it's important for, for, for people to have morals, and morals have to come from the Bible. The morals that we have must come from God. How important it is to know God. You see, knowing God personally, knowing God personally, has to do with believing in Him. Now, I don't have all the answers tonight to refute the world's attacks. I just know the Lord. Now, here's the way I reason it out in my mind. Someone walks up to me and says, I believe in evolution. I don't believe in the Bible. My first, usually my first statement is to them, where do you start? Whereas, you see, everything has to be, have a beginning. This bench up here on this front row had a beginning. You and I cannot comprehend anything that does not have a beginning because we live in this world where every single thing we know about, you cannot, in your thinking, you cannot even imagine, not, not that you can't find something to illustrate it, but you can't find any, you cannot even imagine in your mind tonight, if you just try it, just imagine something has no beginning. You cannot do it. Because everything you know has a beginning. And so I ask people, where do you begin? They say, well, we begin four billion years ago, five billion years ago. And people who study evolution tell me that if you had five billion years, that's not enough time, according to the theory that the evolutionist has, that's not enough time to get where we are today. They believe in an old earth. I believe in a young earth. I believe God created it, just like the Bible says, in six days. And they say, well, we began four or five billion years ago. That uh, there, was a big, there was a big boom. I said, well, what was before the big boom? Well, I don't know. I say, you know where I begin? I, been, I began with God. And they say, well, who created God? And I say, nobody. I don't understand that. Because I cannot imagine, in my finite mind, I cannot imagine 
anything that does not have a beginning because everything that I know and everything that I have has a beginning. I cannot imagine. But the Bible says, the Word of God tells me that God has no beginning. Look over, if you would, in your Bible in Exodus, the third chapter, verse 14. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me to you. Now I studied that, that word, I, that name of God. Here's the name of God, I am. I studied what other people say about it. And it, it means the, the self-existent one. The one who had no beginning and has no end. I don't understand it. I believe it. Because when you start out with creation, you have to go back somewhere. You have to have a beginning. And when you finally get back to the place where you want to start, you have to either throw up your hands and say, well, it all happened by accident. I don't know how it happened, but I know it happened by accident. I don't know where it came from. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I don't understand God. But I know he's the Alpha and the Omega. I know that he is the beginning. Now, scientists are smart people, and I don't want to put them down. But sometimes we look at science and we think, boy, they're infallible. They never make a mistake. Scientists are smart people. Most of them are probably far more intelligent than I am. But one thing I have learned, they don't have all the answers. And they've made some pretty big Mistakes. Remember when you were in school? Most of us are old enough to remember that there were nine planets. That was in our textbook. There are, that was concrete. That was written in stone. There are nine. We memorized those nine planets. Remember? That's written in stone. There were nine planets. Not today. There's eight. And now they're saying that there's, a, if you, you, by the new definition of planets, there may be as many as 54 planets out there. Scientists don't know everything. Now, I don't know either, and we have to be careful when we're talking about creation. But it's interesting to me. You see, I trust the one who has all the answers. The Bible hasn't changed. It never changes. God never changes. Think about that, young people. And I trust in the, I, I, it's interesting to me that I trust in the God of the Bible, the most intelligent being ever. I trust in intelligence for, for, what, for this world being here. I trust in creation by an intelligent being. Scientists say they trust in happenstance. Here are people who are supposed to go on facts. Here are people who are supposed to figure things out that everything has a cause and everything has a fact. And they say, we believe in, in happenstance. Kind of backwards, isn't it? Well, let me ask you. Do you know God? Do you know him as your creator? Do you believe him as your creator? Here in Ecclesiastes, it says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure. And then remember your Creator. In this society today, we would, be, we would do well to listen to those words. Secondly, God reveals Himself by His names. In Jeremiah 33, 2, Thus saith the Lord, the Maker thereof, the Lord that formed it, to establish it, the Lord is His name, if you notice the word Lord in your Bible, it's always in capitals. Capital, the L is bigger, but when you, when you follow the letters across, they're, always, they're, they're in capitals. Now, sometimes it's not, uh, and that's the difference that we're talking about here. But when it's always in capitals, it's talking about the Lord's name 
And I don't say this very often, but it's in the scripture, so I will use it. Jehovah. Turn with me, if you would, to Exodus chapter 6, verse 3. Let me get over there. Exodus 6, 3. And I, excuse me, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. Now, that name is used right there in the first part of the scriptures. They knew the name, but God was revealing himself here to Moses in a fuller way. But he's saying here, I want you to know my name. Now, God's name means the being of beings. He's revealing himself here in a personal way to Moses and especially to Israel. And he's saying, I'm the God of the Israelites. I'm the all-powerful God of the Israelites. I'm revealing myself to you by my name because I want you to know me and I want to know you. He's a personal God. He's the creator. And he wants to know his creation personally. He wants to fellowship with people who will live for him. People who will fellowship with him and not just be friendly to him. See, God wants more than friendship. God wants fellowship. To fellowship, I looked it up in Webster's Dictionary. To fellowship, according to Webster's Dictionary, it means to share an experience or experiences together. God wants to share some experiences with every one of us. It means to have the same interests. Boy, people need to read that and they need to think about what fellowship is today with the Lord because to see, to fellowship with God, we have to have the common interest that God wants us to have. We can't have our interest and him have his interest and say that I know the Lord, I fellowship with him. No, we, re, we, just, we just quoted the scripture there in 1 John 1, 5 through 7. Fellowship is knowing the Lord being saved uh, through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's having the same interests. Just to be a companion. Is God your companion? Do you know him and does he walk with you? Constantly. That's what a companion is. Someone who's with us constantly. And it's to love. Actually, Webster didn't say it was to love, but when you go through all that, when you share an experience and you have the same interest and, you and your companions, you have to have love there. God wants us to love him. Not just to be friendly, but to fellowship with him. You see, God is a God of love. That's the gospel, isn't it? That's his son, the second person of the Trinity. The Lord Jesus Christ came and died on the cross so people could be saved because he wants to redeem lost sinners so we can be, be, be his and so we can fellowship with him. And when you follow the scripture, there's no question that the Bible that talks about the creator tells us Jesus Christ is a part of the Trinity, that he is deity, that he is God. He's not a created being. He's not like the angels. He's not, a, he's not just, a, he's not a little God or a, another God. He is, he is God, he is, he is Jehovah. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, when you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, you find that that rock that followed the children of Israel, the Bible says that rock was Christ. That's saying back in the Old Testament, the God who followed the children of Israel, that God, that creator God, that God was the Lord Jesus Christ. And we, we see him revealed in the New Testament as Jesus Christ, which means salvation of Jehovah or Christ the anointed. Emmanuel, God is with us. You see, the Lord will not fellowship, though, with those who deny him. Did you know that? God wants fellowship with people. So much he's willing 
that Jesus Christ would come in the world and die from the cross of Calvary so people could be saved. But let me tell you something. God will not fellowship with people who don't want to fellowship with him. People can be lost. People can go to hell. And they do. A lot of people want God to prove himself to them. Let me tell you something. God doesn't have to prove himself to anybody. He's already proven himself. You see, he's a personal God. He's a loving God. He's the creator. He wants his creation to fellowship with him, and he wants us to come to him and accept his son, Jesus Christ, and be saved. But if we don't, if we push him away, if, we're, if we refuse his, his mercy and his grace, he won't fellowship with people who will not fellowship with him. There's a place down by Mobile, Alabama, a few years ago, 1993, in fact, an Amtrak train a barge rammed a, a, a train trestle. An Amtrak train came along, and there were 210 passengers on it. And when the train went across, the trestle gave way, and 47 people perished in the bayou waters there. There was a young th man there named Michael. I hope I get his name right. It's Dofite, I think. When his car fell into the water, he realized what was happening. He pulled a window out, jumped out into the water, alligator-infested waters, by the way, and began to help people. And he helped 30 people. He rescued, he helped rescue 30 people. One of them was, had cerebral palsy. There was a little baby. And he helped adults to safety. They had, they had called in helicopters, and I don't know exactly how they got to that, but he helped 30 people. He was responsible for 30 people not dying. He stayed there in the water and risked his own life to save them. I never read one person that said, I don't want your help. Can you imagine that in the night? I believe it was at night. Can you imagine that being there in the water, alligator infested waters, you'd been riding along safe on a train and suddenly you find yourself in water and this fellow comes up to you, maybe you can't swim, maybe you're crippled, whatever the case may be, and he holds out his hand. Can you imagine somebody saying, no, I don't need your help. But you see, that's what people do to God, isn't it? Here Jesus came and died on the cross so people could be saved. And people say, no, I don't think I need it. See, God is our creator. The scripture says here, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, while well, you can, in other words. I've seen people who put salvation off too long. They're in a rest home. They've had all kinds of diseases that have taken their minds. They, they can no longer accept the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior because something took their mind. I've seen people die. All kinds of things happen. When people say no to their Creator, no, I don't want to be rescued. No, I don't want to be saved. See, He wants people to know Him and fellowship. Let me ask you, do you fellowship with God? Do you share experiences with Him? We're talking about salvation here, not friendship. Do you, ex do you share experiences with the Lord? You should have one experience you've shared with Him. You should have, have somewhere along the line, and you, you should be able to point to the day, the hour, the place. You should be able to say, yes, I have the experience of salvation. I know that the, the Holy Spirit's come in my heart, and I know that I'm saved. And then there should be other experiences. If we fellowship with Him, do you have the same interest? You know, a lot of people today say that they're saved, but they don't have the same interest the Bible talks about. That's not fellowship. I see people who say, I believe in Him. I believe in the God. I believe in God. I've had people say, no, I'm not saved. No, I don't go to church. I believe in God. Listen, to have fellowship with the Lord, you have to have the same interest that God has. You've got to walk with Him. 
And he's got to walk with you and be your companion. Do you love him? The last thing tonight. God reveals himself as the owner. In Deuteronomy, the 10th chapter, verse 14. Behold, the heaven and the heaven of heavens is the Lord's thy God, the earth also with all that therein is. In Psalm 24, 1, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The Lord not only created all things, he controls all things. Oh, is he your creator? Do you know him as creator? Do you know him as the owner? A few years ago in St. Louis, Missouri, I think it was a, a sheet metal shop. A man owned a, a business. And he tried to treat his employees right. But there were some of them who were not satisfied and they wanted a union. I think, I don't know how many people in, in, he employed. It was, it was not a huge shop, but it was not a real small shop. He'd been in that business for many years. And they came to him and asked for a union. He said, no, there will never be a union here. And they decided we're going to, we're going, they had contacted a union and they said, we're going to have a union whether you want it or not. He said, when you do, understand this. He said, I'm to the place now, I don't have to have this shop. He said, I can retire any time. And he said, the day after you vote the union in, I'll close the shop. He said, well, can you do that? He said, yes. I don't owe anything on it. It belongs to me. I'm the owner. They didn't get a union. Did you know God is the owner? You see, he has the right to be the judge. Because he is the owner. He controls. Did you know he controls earthquakes? Well, I know we live in a scientific age, right? Earthquakes happen because of a shifting of the earth underneath the ground. And scientists have tried to predict when, and they've tried hard to predict when, and I guess they've had some success. I don't know. But we look at things from natural causes, and we don't include God. The Bible says it is God who controls earthquakes. Did you know that? He controls famines. He controls nations. He controls all things. Now there's a devil. And Satan causes people harm and bad things. But Satan's under God. God has never lost control. You see, the Lord controls everything. Did you know he even controls good and evil? Over in Isaiah, the 45th chapter, verse 7, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. You see, he's the owner. He's not just the creator. He's the owner. Now, we don't, you see, he's, he's in control. Nothing's going to happen unless he permits it. Back in the 60s, they came out with the bomb. Remember that? The world's going to be destroyed by the bomb. And everybody wrung their hands. Young people wrung their hands. Have a whole generation that disengaged from, from authority and society because they were being told, you're going to die. You're going to die. Mankind's going to destroy itself because we're going to be destroyed by the bomb. And I was preaching back then, just wait a minute. The world's going to go on another thousand years. Man's not going to pull the curtain down on this earth, folks, until God says it's time. It's not going to happen. He's the owner. Now we've got all kinds of things floating around. Global warming. I want to be careful because I'm not an expert on global warming. But think it through. These people are running around today. Same thing. The sky is falling. 
The polar, the polar ice caps are going to melt. We've got gas, greenhouse gases, uh, fossil fuel gases here. We're warming the planet too quick. It's all going to melt. There's going to be, there's going to be tremendous tragedies take place in the world because of global warming. The world's going to end. Not until God says it's going to end. Think about it. They're telling these people today the same thing they told in the 60s. Didn't happen then. And I don't see people who are running around worrying about all this stuff. Why, why is somebody not worrying about the, the pollution of wickedness on the planet? I see, I don't hear these people who are running around saying the world is in such trouble. How come they're not saying the world is in trouble because of immorality and ungodliness and the wickedness that's going? That's what they better worry about. Because that's what's going to call, pull the curtain down on this world. Listen, in Noah's day, When it got bad enough, and it wasn't the environment. It wasn't that man had the ability to destroy himself. God don't read the world like that. You know, if God doesn't want the polar ice caps to melt, did you know what? I don't care how much gas we have in this planet, they won't melt. I'm not too worried about it. I believe Christians ought to be very careful and conservative. We ought to take care of the planet that God's given us. We ought to do the best we can. But I'm not going to let somebody stampede me into thinking the world's going to end because of these things. The world will end when things get wicked and bad. You see, that's what people need to be worrying about. Because you know why? Just put your life in God's hands and serve Him. He's the Creator. He's the Savior. He's the owner. Listen, God's in control. And the last thing tonight, God reveals Himself as the judge in Acts, the 17th chapter, verse 31, because He hath appointed a day in which He will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom He hath ordained. Whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. God over 40 times in the Bible says, I created it all. He tells us he is the judge. You know, we must stand before him. That's where our eyes ought to be fixed on. Our eyes ought to be fixed on. Our concern should be, do we please God? I understand that a few months ago, the United States shot down one of its own satellites. It had to judge one of its own satellites. We had put a spy satellite out in space. It was out there for a purpose, and it lost its purpose, and it got out of control, and it was headed back toward Earth. It was going to do great damage. It would not obey, it would not obey the controller. It would not do what it was told to do, and the order came down. because it was carrying some really very explosive gas and they didn't want it to come through the atmosphere and harm somebody. It was out of control. And the word came down. Shoot down our own satellite. And a ship just off the coast of Hawaii fired a missile and blew it out of space before it hit the atmosphere. We had to destroy a satellite that was out of control. God is the creator. He's the savior. He's a personal God. He will fellowship with those who want to fellowship with him. He will not fellowship with those who don't want to fellowship with him. You shake your hands at God and say, Lord, I don't like the way you're running this planet. I just don't agree with it. I don't like it. We'll go somewhere else. He's the owner. He's got control. And I'll tell you something else. He's the judge. And everybody one day will stand before him and give an account of their life to the creator. He is God. Let's pray.